Olá, eu me chamo Amanda Carneiro. My name is Amanda Carneiro. I'm the assistant curator at MASP and I'm the editor of the After All um, journal. This event is being held in three different languages. I'll be speaking Portuguese myself and our speakers will speak Spanish. We also have simultaneous translation available into English. So please make sure you select the language of your preference at the bottom bar of your Zoom screen. You want to hear the event using the globe icon at the bottom of your screen. Sejam bem-vindos ao simpósio. Welcome to the decolonization seminar in the 2020s. This is the beginning of a series of seminars and articles organized by the Museum of Art from São Paulo, C. Chateaubriand, and after all, a research center headquartered in central St. Martins from the University of the Arts from London on art and decolonization. The project has been going on since 2018 and researches mainly uh, colonial legacy in contemporary art, curatorship, education, and art criticism, along with the Decolonizing Arts Institute and the Department of Visual Culture from Goldsmiths from the University of London. During this seminar, we're going to address the main challenges on decolonization in this decade. And we're also going to talk about some institutional problems. All throughout the month of March, we're going to have online discussions along with artists, activists, researchers, and art workers. Each of them, each of these debates will focus on different topics. Our speakers talks will be published in the art school platform from after all in English and the translation into Portuguese will be made available in the art and decolonization web page at MASP's website. At the description of this event, you'll find those links. We're going to talk about five topics today. We're going to be talking about museums. And for that, we're going to hear from Elvira Espejo and Victoria Northrum. After that, we're going to talk about gender decolonization articles, university and art practices. These meetings will be held online on Zoom and they will be recorded and made available afterwards in our channels. So stay tuned to MASP's social media and after all social media too. This session will last one and a half hours. Our speakers will speak for about 20 minutes and after that we are going to answer your questions. Please make sure you pose your questions in the written form in the chat box. With that, let's start our event. I wanted to introduce you to Elvira Espejo, our first guest. She's the visual artist, musician, weaver, and oral tradition storyteller. From her place of origin, Ailo Kakachaka from in Oruro, Bolivia. I'm sorry if I mispronounced the name of your place of origin, Elvira. She is the head of the National Ethnography and Folk Museum from La Paz. In 2020, she won the Goethe Medal, which is a um, great accomplishment, which is given by the German government to different artists. She has, ex she has been part of exhibitions in the Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid and House de Cultura de Welt in Berlin, as well as in the Space Simone I in La Paz. The text she's going to be talking about today is the painful division of art has created a hierarchy on us and colonized us. And this text is based on the idea of a universal type of education and will be the foundation of her presentation today. It's a pleasure to have you here, Elvira. I hand it over to you and thank you very much for joining us during this session. Thank you for accepting our invite. Thank you. Elvira, 
Avira, I guess you are on mute. Can you please unmute yourself? I do apologize. First and foremost, I would like to thank everybody that invited me to this event. That is decolonization. That is a very important event. And I'm here together with Victoria, that is my colleague, and we met in the middle of museums, management and projection of museums. That is very interesting. Well, today I would like to share my my personal experience. And, and this is how I see this from a from the local, from the regional, from the national point of view, and perhaps this is a more Latin American view in terms of art and craft, because it is very interesting to understand how we understand things and how we are made to believe in matters of academic structures that are highly vertical. Therefore, I would like to start with a small personal introduction where I had a self-reflection that was very deep in terms of education. I come from a community. This is a village in the south of Oruro, Bolivia. And when I reached the fine arts academic, the education on arts, I'm talking about about 20 years ago, Everything was very Eurocentric, so that because art, they said art emerged in Europe, art was developed in Europe, and therefore what is modern is projected from North America. And uh, I was reflecting and I was thinking, what was art? And then I start reading the academic text and I see when art is strong, like in terms of like of aesthetics. So starting when we start with Latin that conceptualizes broadly of doing things because everything is praxis was between craft and something doing and doing something this in reality this leads to very interesting innovation in terms of doing things in different ways or in different specialties or in different territories and uh, all of this changes precisely in the fifth to towards the 15th and 16th century in aesthetic that is different they separate craft and art and this separation between art and craft i believe that is highly discriminating because there they are those that have the education and the creation are the best and they're the ones that better produce in and in different indigenous community, what is produced in indigenous community is not art, these are popular crafts. Now, questioning us in depth in terms of linguistic terms in this case, when you think about the communities and the villages, when you think about Aymara, what is art? How do we understand art in Aymara? In reality, there is art in all the dynamics of the peoples and communities. Nonetheless, the terminology, the, the very strict terminology, when you think about the academic uh, education where they don't mutually respect these new actions, it is very complex and there is a great bias here for everyone like trying to unify a massive consumption of art 
that is part of education. Now, in this sense of self-reflection, I work with many communities in the villages of different regions of my of countries in Latin America, and in terms of praxis, of practice to understand another no notion. Here, I understand art in depth when we talk about doing with your hands and doing with your hands. Uh, visual education comes in through the fingers, how the fingers can scan, how your fingers can feel, how this feeling transfers to the body and how the body feels this texture, how it feels the smell, how it feels this landscape. It is impressive that it goes way beyond what is said in terms of aesthetics, in terms of perception of a masterpiece inside a four-wall room or like in a, or in a window where you have, in terms of community, this indication awakens an action in Aymara, Ruraña. In addition to doing with your hands and scanning and feeling, you have to measure your lives in terms of learning. Like for instance, when you grab the yarn or the thread or from the sheep, there is a great variety of textures of, of the yarn. It can be from a calf that can be fine. It could be an animal that is more mature, that is going to be rougher. You have different parts of the fibers that will provide you different textures. All of this education, when you're six, seven, eight years of age, when we are introduced to all of this, and when we work through our fingers, you know, how we feel things in the tip of our fingers, this stores in our memory and this gives us the feeling of sensitivity, the notion of sensitivity when you reach a certain age. Like for instance, when you become 80 years old, when you cannot see properly and you hear even less, you have the sensitivity of being able to assess with your fingers to be able to feel the essence of accumulated sensitiveness in your body. All this performance of sensitive education is within the communities. This is how we work with raw material, how we understand all of this raw material in terms of selection, pre-selection, shared interpretations in the dynamic of understanding the language. The tool in this case, that would be the spinning wheel and how to be able to understand Lee and to unite to, to uh, spheres of, strong, of strength that are your hands. These are broad educations of, your, of the internal body performance and it interprets uh, deeply and this runs through your body when you work like the body movement is, in is part of this action of working with the yarn or how this feeds your your ear when you listen how the spinning wheel works how you feel the yarn and what kind of noise this provokes, all this complexities of the art that we have in the communities were ignored by the academia because they only talk about aesthetics and this infects the research because they're focused on the beauty of many people always ask about the notion of what is or what is iconography? What does this mean inside a community? When the weavers start producing, 
we as weavers, as we do things with our hands, we are not concerned about the iconography and the meaning. We want to count the threads. We want to add, subtract. We want to multiply. And we want to make with the great amount of threads that we have. And with this, we will create something and that will result in something that will be predominant for the perception of research. So in this sense, for us as weavers of these villages of, or of communities, we see that the greatest bias is this vertical structure of the formal academia that does not value Oh, I mean, they don't understand the notion from communities, from villages, and they don't understand the structural language, like we say, how Mapogun would displace in its original language, how we and Aymaren and Quechua have this systematization of understanding these actions and these terminology. They allow us to understand this complex structure in order to understand how to talk about art from our point of view and not assume this information from outside because I had this experience in terms of museology that is important and for me this has been highly interesting to have two completely different views the museographist graduated by the university only pays attention to the superficial beauty, what is beautiful, elegant, what has form, what has color, and perhaps in conservation terms and preservation terms, but they don't see the construction as the textile artists do. And the, and the interpretation for the weavers is to count the yarns to see the textile. The, the other side, if it's simple, complex, for this you need a 3D understanding, not a 2D understanding like a picture on the wall. So for this, we have to understand as society this. And we see a very strong colony when we see how to superficially perceive, how to perceive internally these actions and how to understand in philosophical terms from the communities in their own language because all of this was strongly interrupted with this formal academic structure that is like creating a monoculture of the art history. So that is very complicated because all that deployment in terms of university, in terms of education, in terms of school, even nowadays, we still have the, that perspective. So that doesn't really give us an opening to having, to having a multi-language, to understand knowledge beyond what's traditional, what we've had so far. So in this reflection, I wanted to share a little bit of this idea that we can understand things as a society, as a people, and also we can try and understand having our roots as a perspective, we can try to understand history, ethnography, the contemporary culture, etc. So all that deployment, I would say, makes us think about the system of universal art, how it works and how Latin America can also get projected here in this, in this sphere. Just like Asia could also do that, doing um, some work with ceramics, with other things. And this way we wouldn't have a difficulty in having art based on this pyramid we would be more horizontal we would have more mutual respect i would say we would have we would be giving these original voices more power we would understand things from a different perspective 
So after all that I've mentioned, if we understand this way of feeling things, we will understand contempor some contemporary artists who are trying to project that as a performance in galleries, in art galleries. We have to think about the essence of this. Sometimes these actions, they are coming from a landscape, they're coming from a territory, and it, it is very nice to bring this to an art gallery because we need to think about accessibility, the territory, the landscape, something that comes with wind and the sound of the water and the heat of the fire. You see, it is more complicated, of course, to bring all those feelings, but it would be very nice to try and build that bridge for different communities and to have co-authors here. We have, we would have the artists and the communities being co co-authors co really in this art, in this type of art. That of course would bring more mutual respect, as I mentioned before. The expert, the artist must have that sensitivity to bring the community together into their works of art. It's very important for curators and for artists to have that sensitivity. And we must reach a certain point of balance to be able to do that in the future. This way we would, we would be able to understand the future a little bit better. Anyway, we need to have more maturity from a language perspective, from that co-authoring perspective, and also how education can be a revolution in this, in verticalizing all this. So we, in this self-reflection, we can also try and expand the way communities can be part of this type of action with culture in art galleries and museums. So I know this is very important and probably in the future, the idea is for us to all understand each other a little bit better to have more mutual respect. And I'm sure that could help us bring more information, more initiatives to the table. And I believe that we will have a closer, better look into communities, culture, and works of art. Well, of course, I am here for you. If you have any questions, if you have any comments, I will be pleased to talk to you all. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you so much. Elvira, for your words and your thoughts and the thoughts that they provoke. Once again, to those of you who are listening to us, Elvira's words will be published in English at the After All website and it will be available in Portuguese on MASP's website where we'll have some more in-depth thoughts about what she just shared with us. Before I turn it over to Victoria, I would just like to remind everyone that your questions, your thoughts, your comments can be shared with all of us through the chat box. I'll be watching out for them and we'll answer your questions at the end of the talks. So I'd like to introduce Victoria. Northroom. She's the director of the Buenos Aires Modern Art Museum. She's been a director since 2013. She used to work for MoMA and the Drawing Center in New York. She's already worked for Malba in Buenos Aires. She was the curator at the Cali Artists National Salon in Colombia 2008 and the Pontevedra Biennale in 2006 in Spain and the Mercosur Biennale here in Brazil in 2009 and the Lyon Biennale in 2011, among many other exhibits. Since November 2019, she's been a member of the board 
at the International Committee for Museums and Collections of Modern Art and ICOM, the International Council of Museums. Victoria has also written a text that's been made available on our platforms. It's called Three Attempts to Decolonize the South, and her presentation will be based on that text. Victoria, thank you so much for saying yes to our invitation. Thank you for joining us today, and I will turn it over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you very much, Amber, everyone really, everyone in the team at Mass, Goldsmith, after all, I am so happy to be here. I am representing the Museum of Buenos Aires of Modern Art, and for us it is very important to be interacting with you to have this kind of dialogue. It's very nice to have Elvira here as well, because I truly admire her. I love listening to, to her ideas. It is great inspiration, really. So thank you, Elvira, for that. I was thinking here about how can we expand on those ideas. Thank you. I am reflecting upon all that. I am also happy to to be here with people from Brazil. It is a very difficult situation we know right now. So we hope, we wish you the best and the condolences really. It's very sad to listen to people who have lost some family members, friends. So we all hope this is going to be over soon. Well, I am going to be reading my text to avoid, you know, getting distracted. And actually, I wanted to, again, thank you all for the invitation. I'm very thankful for being here. So my text is called Three Attempts to Decolonize the South. This pandemic has shown some social, economic, and cultural differences just like the strategies that determine the domination of a group over another one, uh, with the colonial logics that are still true in our societies. Along with this, we find a series of logics and processes that will profoundly affect the functioning of any modern art museum that wants to be contemporary and sensitive to the context that the current context. All these years, the Museum of Modern Art in Buenos Aires has been investigating some artistic movements, some individual practices, both historic and contemporary practices. And this has shown once and again that we can only offer a space for art if we challenge all the inequalities that have to do with the original colonial perspective. This perspective happens again and again, instead of being corrected. Whenever we establish an equivalence between what's modern and what's Western or what's multicultural and what's globalized. So we have this well-established global North. Well, at the heart of any process of decolonization, there is the need to question any idea of superiority, precedence, or teleology that will position Western on top of Eastern or North against South, or Western or North as a goal or something ideal for the Eastern world or the South. This doesn't really imply denying the effects of these social processes on individuals. Actually, the idea is to make them visible, to show people what the problem is. This is the main concern for us in, at the museum in Buenos Aires. We're trying to share this idea. We're trying to be an agent of the present. We try to promote the artistic thinking in different, in different art, exhibits. We usually have around 10 a year. So with all this, we have to, of course, let go of the old 
and try and redefine the priorities for the current scenario and more immediately to deal with the emergency that we're dealing with right now. With all these years at the Museum of Modern Art, we've been trying to redefine our priorities and our mission to affirm our ambition to be a reference for art in Argentina, for modern and contemporary art, and also for the connection between art and education in the city of Buenos Aires, in the region and in the world. We want to be a museum for everyone, for the country. We want to be inclusive. We want to be accessible as well, and to truly fight for freedom of expression. This emphasis on the importance of what's local and need to give an immediate response to our context is the logic result of a process of historiog historiogra historiographic um, revision. It has taken three different paths here. First of all, we have to contest, we have to go against the idea of what's dominant, of the, the old, traditional things that we accepted as true we try to bring to light the real characteristics of what we have in Latin America. It is innovative. It is important for the 20th century. We are trying to establish uh, the history of art to reposition Euro-American or North American practices with a function and to bring, to bring a dialogue with Latin American practices. We have so many isms here that won't really contribute for any comprehension or understanding of the power of art. We need to bring all the voices and gestures from local artists. Historia de dos mundos, history of two worlds, is just one of the 10 exhibits that we've had, the international exhibits that we've had, presented at Museo Moderno since 2013. And we have an internal curatorship to bring this approach. The second path that I wanted to mention here has to do with bringing all the local narratives to light from different regions in Argentina and the 20th and 21st century as well. We have the exhibit Una Historia de la Imaginación en Argentina, so story about imagination in Argentina, bringing 250 words of art from the north, the northeast, and so many different regions in the country. We have our curator Javier Villa working on that. And he said, we should forget all of the isms. Sorry, I think my mic didn't work for a while, says Victoria. So I'm going to repeat what I was saying. As I was saying, uh, our curator is Javier Villa, and he said, we should forget all of the isms, the eras or the aesthetics or the strategies that are the root of the art in Argentina. Should we do that or even suspend or ignore our own ideas about these structures? Should we? Should we forget about all the, the enthusiasm that we had in the in the past especially when it comes to european art and all that traditional art what would happen if we became more conservative and started talking about tradition nationally talking about our national identity we should at least try here in the south we're not going to be uh, considered fascists just because we're just want to talk about us. The second idea that we had about this exhibit was pretending that the legacy from Europe was a kind of disease. You see, in the, in the 19th century, when this state was being built, the privilege in Buenos Aires was replicating colonial strategies, bringing from all that domination the, the traditional approach. So at Museo Moderno, Javier Villa said, this is not based on the, art, the history of art so much, but on 
the fiction of the Argentinian literature and what the works and landscapes had to do. We weren't trying to find the great masters that we already knew. We weren't trying to find or refine all the forgotten artists. What we were trying to do was learn. We wanted to see different things that weren't known in Buenos Aires. We were trying to see what the need was to establish a new definition that was more inclusive so that we could recognize ourselves in this new reality. These territories are the place where we're fighting. I mean, this soil is also a cemetery where there are people dying, people, dictators and their followers, rich people, poor people, men, women. This tragic story is in the exhibit because it is an important part of history that we should reassess. The history of imagination in Argentina uses the past to also dive deep into the present. How can we reinterpret the genocide of indigenous peoples today? Where do we put our the, the bodies of the dead people? How do we deal with the, the bodies of women and men and also this geopolitical theme. In the museum, it is very important to think about our curatorships, educational and social initiatives with the goal to respond to the challenges in the current scenario. And we also have to build an archive of the present around the works and ideas and reflections of the artistic community in Argentina. This emphasis on what's local is a characteristic of our program ever since 2013. We've been trying to bring more visibility to the artists in Argentina. We have 65 exhibits of artists in Argentina. Ever We've had 65 so far as a way of bringing justice in this local context, because for decades, they didn't really receive their merit. And nowadays, because of the pandemic, due to COVID-19, there was a program prioritizing what's local. And now we are in a position of a little bit more power. We're probably more ready than before to deal with the challenges that we have to solve and overcome. We have to not just have exhibits that will sell because of great masters, because of famous works of art. We need to bring something different to museums. From March to until October 2020, for instance, we had to close the museum and it was a long time. We are trying to deal with, with this fragility of social networks because of the characteristics of domination that are even more uh, frequent now because of the pandemic. We also developed the digital program Museo Moderno en Casa, um, Modern Museum at Home, to offer more support to the community and to the families and to everyone working with education from home. So we're looking at different topics and things related to this. So over 20 programs, virtual programs that we've had so far, they have brought many artists from all over uh, around the country and this commitment has made us have a better investigation about this need. One of these programs, as you can imagine, I don't know how much we have to display to walk to be a representative museum and we became a more federal museum to debate the centralism mentioned above. A terrible void was created when on May 31st of 2020, just six days after the murder of George Floyd, another brutal act of police violence took place here in Argentina in Fontana in the province of Chago when officers of the third police station in Banderas, Argentina's neighborhood broke into a house in the indigenous community, beat and tortured the people living there and then arrested and raped them. The, the victim was doused with alcohol to the cries of infected Indians threatened with being buried alive. 
In comparison to the global outcry in the response of the murder of George Floyd, the silence of the Argentine media regarding these crimes. Until today, the museum had a politicized curatorship without assuming uh, to report local matters. That day, we, uh, we, we saw that we couldn't become silent to all the efforts to be relevant, to answer to our public through programs that connect art education to training teachers, the accessibility schemes, mental health programs in partnership with hospitals, with and all the programs for social inclusion and historical address for human rights violation would only make sense if we adopted an outspoken institutional stance in the face of the extreme commitment concomitants of the COVID-19 pandemic and the human rights violations that have taken place in the past. With these convictions, we began preparing the program about racism program, which we will, which presented September last year to address the issue of racism in a country that considers itself to be very anti-racism. And first of all, to bring visibility to the existence of the problem, we hired a research company to conduct a study on race racism in Argentina. The main conclusion was that the Argentinian people recognize the seriousness of racism in the country, but do not see themselves as racist. It's always the other that is racist. We invited Fabio Leredia, director of the Museum of Anthropology of the National University of Cordoba in Argentina to guide us from the sociological perspective and approaches to artistic content proposed by artists from over the country to understand more fully the complexity and consequences of all the statements we invited artists to speak directly about the hierarchical value chains associated with identities sharing with us works in which they describe and denounce the behaviors gestures and practices associated with discrimination and the forms taken by the social production of racism today. The, I am going to finish in a while. The result was a program of aesthetic and political content that we call, am I a racist? And we set forth the following question, how does racism operate in this multiple ways here and now amongst all of ourselves. What happens when we talk about race? Which are the markers of social difference that exist in our country? Is it possible to bend identities outside of social markers that we quickly give cultural meanings? What the, what do contemporaneous societies mean when we talk about indigenous, about Afro population? How do we simplify of this? As our context, racism is invisibilized, is silenced and made up to continue operating in multiple ways. The same happens with certain works that exhibit processes of exclusion based on bodily and phenotypic redu reductions. This happens because although ra racism is associated with hatred ge generated by ethnic identities, and they are expressed by other forms of social difference, such as gender, class, or religious affiliation. In this context, to speak of racism implies making visible all situations of discrimination and depreciations that perpetuate colonialist power relations. To conclude, there are three strategies that the Museo of Arte Moderna uses in order to implement a revisionist practice of colonialism in Argentina the creation of exhibition and programs that present both local and international artistic practices with the aim of always reformulating them from a decolonial Southern Latin America center point of view, rejecting the possibility of presenting canned products from abroad to an obsessive insistence on the importance of local art in all its historical expressions and content. Three, an, in a an incessant research focused on the contemporary art world as well as in all its federal complexity and to the we 
we have social cultural characterization in ours we have to see where to emphasize in these dualities to know where these hegemonies exist if we're going to revert this in a and uh, act, we have to act as angels that foster inside and provoke the existence of the world. We cannot see how, how societies are around this polarity. We have to be agents to inside provoke the existence of other worlds. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria, for your kind words. Thank you for your talk and thank you, Elvira, once again. I believe the text you have submitted to us and the questions that have been posed during your talk speak quite a lot on the relationship between north, south, center, periphery, local and global, and local and institutional knowledge and or extra institutional knowledge. In the programs you carry out in your museums, you focus on local dynamics, but you also try to implement broader um, conversations from your context. And in that regard, I have a question for you. What challenges and lessons you learned in your own institutions as museum directors that lead such programs? Since you focus on the local sphere, what were your main challenges and learnings? We also have a question from one of our participants. Denis Stoliarov, sorry if I mispronounced your surname, he thanks you for your talk and he also asks you a question. Can we have different schools of knowledge going about at the same time? Can we have different institutional systems at once instead of thinking about one single global inclusive system which will be colonial from the very beginning so what do you think about nationalist movements that use the decolonizing rhetoric to contradict the national approach so how can we have a local scale focus and not reproduce a nationalist discourse since we won't have much time for questions i just asked two questions at once i can repeat the question if you need me to whoever wants to go first please be my guest elvira would you like to start very clearly Elvira's presentation answers directly this question. You know, regarding having different types of knowledges. Now, from the museum's point of view, I believe that there is an abyss between what is local and to have an exacerbated nationalism precisely it is when you bet on on the argentine artists with all of their knowledge understanding the complexity of the knowledge that the artists have with their research you know works that they work with science with education when they work with policy with popular culture levita was talking about fabric as textile as a world of this of sensorial discoveries we can also think about the artists that work here in the middle of a city 
like Buenos Aires with a thriving popular culture, like like Sergio de Love that was an artist, they worked with recycled material, everything that you have at hand, always producing ephemeris works. There is such an expanded knowledge within each one of the artists that we can work that I believe that if you, if you understand as an institution, an institution dedicated to modern and contemporary art, that you are at the service of this creation of this power that is art, and you stay these individual poetry, uh, but but it's also community poetry and collective poetry. What emerges is a micro policy, the possibility of doing something as an example to create another social reality. You don't have to focus necessarily on the local, but on the individual practices of artists that work in a context. And for this, you need a lot of knowledge that goes many times beyond this uh, this context and will resonate international, internationally. Elvira, I don't know if you would like to say something. I would like to say that we are not talking about local, regional, or being nationalist. This is an international matter of how we understand these different actions of development, science, art, technology that many times goes through craft and a simplification. And sometimes it is interesting to understand how you treat cotton pashmina silk in Asia and also talk about the understanding of wool linen in Europe and in Latin Latin America we have Camilido that we have in Chile, Argentina, Bolivia, Peru, and Colombia, Ecuador. So all of these development dynamics in different regions and in different communities. Well, here there are certain actions that are according to society, culture, identity, and also developments in terms of praxis that generates its own ways of doing things that have other meanings. And many times when we generalize in international terms, we ignore them and like we put we eliminate some terminologies for human mutual respect. We have to understand this pluri pluri diversity of arts. It could be textile ceramics, it could be metals, it could be lytic terms. Everything goes way beyond what we could set forth here. And I believe that we have to, we can respect all the small differences. And we also have to understand that this surrounding or this environment or these museums or cultural centers should have the notion of broadness and to open these diverse compositions because many times they're only focused on a vertical formal outline and to innovate together with society will be different than an understanding. Well, we followed strongly the communities and we also went to the communities with exhibitions and this creates other dimensions. It is like to absorb the cultural products of the communities and taking them to the museum and not giving them back to, to whom they belong in terms of information and in terms of research, documentation, promotion, it is important. And modern contemporaneous in temporaneous innovation. This is a broad field and we have to understand from a number of points of view so that we can have mutual respect for the diversity of knowledge and ways of thinking. 
Thank you, Elvira. There is a question for you. Next and question I believe goes to you. that it's connected to plur plurality and of diversity. That is from a, Albina Sakan. Elvira, next question goes to you. Albina Sakan says, thank you for sharing your perspective, Elvira. She says, as I understand it, the barrier for the society to remove hierarchies in art is the notion that we need a common, maybe the same knowledge. The solution is therefore to introduce new perspectives that challenge that. Would that be the right takeaway from what you said? E aí acho que também dá para você falar um pouco sobre sobre essa ideia da hierarquia na arte, né? Can you talk about hierarchy in art? and how we can do away with that. What we saw in many countries was the subject of hierarchy that was, was being complex for the communities and set by social classes. And we also have education or training, and this is highly notorious when we see art history in anthropocentrism, that is anthropology, when we have information. Sometimes as researchers, we go to the community to attain information, and we are like reporters, we are co-authors of the thought and many, many and this also happens with contemporary art sometimes there are objects in the communities from certain artists and this could also be due to it's the education and the fame that the person has things follow this directions to obtain these cultural products of the communities. And I believe that we could put them in the formal rooms of the museums. I believe that this entire dynamic demands uh, self-reflection amongst all of us to see how we can have mutual respect amongst us in terms of formal art, informal art, art of the people, art for community of the region. So I believe that this is a matter of understanding beyond and to be and not only understand the structure of academic education and artistic education that sometimes have certain things that are not in accordance accordance with modern and contemporary realities of understanding and mutual respect, especially communities uh, from indigenous people. We have some very challenging questions. Gaynor Tutani is asking, fundamentally, what is it to decolonize a museum? I'm smiling because we've been having a series of conversations since 2018 to work out what it is to decolonize a museum. And asking you that question might sound quite challenging because there is no one single answer to it, but perhaps it would be good to hear your perspective on what it means to decolonize a museum and she goes on to say is it a practice is it a principle or is it a process how can museum workers such as the ones you run see this decolonization process is it possible to measure it is it really just an idea or a dream that is potentially difficult to fulfill it's a long question, I think, as I said, I'm smiling because we've had a series of conversations that have attempted to answer that question. So feel free to share your thoughts. Well, I could share an experience that we had in Bolivia about that idea, not just for art, but for many other dimensions as well. You need a lot of self-reflection, you need a lot of knowledge, you need a lot of information on how you understand art per se. 
in the originary peoples and the different communities and how that could also have an impact on the contemporary world, internationally speaking. So that self-reflection, that broad discussion, that those self-questions, I would say, they take a while, of course. It takes a while for that idea, that concept to mature. And that could follow different directions, epistemology, aesthetics, beauty. You see all these contents, all these aspects, they're, they're really broad. You have to assess them very carefully so you can revisit the, the present from this multi-diverse cultural aspect or perspective. That's very important because it is a very dynamic system that we're living in. We've had over 36 different peoples, indigenous peoples, for instance, in our region. And we brought all that from Europe, all that from other countries when we were building history. So there were some structural schemes that were brought. And also, after the colony started, there were some other directions that were followed. We have to consider all those aspects nowadays as a, a real question for the universal system and the universe, per se. You see, all these dynamics, they make us think about different points of view. And it is not just that we're going to solve everything with actions. It's a part action, a part information this is going this is going to take many years this is going to be a challenge still for generations to come but we can still start initiatives we can try and start that process of trying to understand decolonization because again that is going to take a lot of self-reflection about the past about what we've done so far and the hierarchy the structures that the very society has accepted so far. But we have to fully understand what has happened so far to be able to start that process and to understand art, economics, philosophy, anthropology, technology, so many different spheres in that regard. And from this, from my standpoint, I think that would be it. We shouldn't just focus on one thing individually. We have to think about a diversity of themes. Well, I believe, as Elvira was saying, I believe that it is indeed a process. And it is very ambitious, of course, because of the of, of how complex this is. But it's something that also encourages us to move forward. I was going to say that if anyone here is also a director of a, an institution, of a program, my tip would be you have to be very persistent. You have to insist there will be many obstacles, but you have to take a deep breath and continue. You have to be convinced that a museum or any cultural organization really is a potential agent of change. So the idea is not just showing people what the truth is. That's not the case. What we have to do is to generate constantly more curiosity. We have to stimulate, we have to promote imagination. We believe at our museum that that is the real engine for human development. So we need to make sure that we're allowing people to have that freedom of expression, that freedom of imagination so that we can witness this change. We can be part of this process of building a different world with all the artists, even though it is a very complex thing, but we will be at, at their service, you know, for this process. We want to bring this closer to society as a whole. I think that's what's beautiful about the activities of a museum. We sometimes think about a museum as being a very fixed, um, rigid, traditional institution, but it can be 
an institution that is constantly suggesting different things. It's constantly changing, bringing new commitments. So we have to make sure that we're sustaining that good dynamic. We have to respond to change very quickly. We have to be in connection with the world, with the territory, as Elvira was saying. There are a few things that we do specifically for one goal, but we're really thinking about how relevant that is, globally speaking. We're always thinking about different levels of what we do, of the impact of what we do. So I think it is a privilege to be part of a museum, to be part of a, a cultural organization. Something important about this as well is that a museum is really a team, a team of young and not so young people who are suggesting things constantly to try and execute different ways of doing things, different ways of thinking, opening doors to the unknown, to something different. So it is a privilege, again, to, to be part of this, to maintain this work, to take care of this and to promote it. So we are lucky to be working with a cultural institution and we have to make sure that we're really occupying that space the right way to try and reach, as Elvira was saying, to try and reach out to the sensitivity of everyone. There is a very sensitive thing here to being artistic, isn't there? So anyway, even from a political standpoint, this is also very important. This is something that connects body and soul. It is our reason, raison d'être. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Victoria. I think that there's another point there, which is food for thought and has been food for thought in conversations about arts and decolonization. And some people actually question that there's some co-optation of art and museums without an actual change of museum structures. And I think different movements are claiming a decolonization that isn't thought out or based on politics of collections or exhibits, but also the dynamics of access and power and positions of power and hierarchy. I think that conversation also includes those reflections about the universe, but also the structures of power in museums. Our time is almost up, but there is one last question. Jose Segrebi asked a really good question, which I think can be our final question. Uh, if you would like to comment on what I've just said, please feel free to do so. But I didn't want to end this conversation without asking this question. He thanks you for your very inspiring talks and your questions that have prompted a lot of reflection and he'd like to hear about your thoughts on the digitization of museums and education that used to be slow and now has speeded up due to the pandemic and his question is very relevant in my opinion which is how do we see that in terms of alternative forms of knowledge how can digitization be seen, considering Elvira's comments on the suppression of touch and other sensory expressions, because, because art is very closely related to presence and virtualization, digitization is not a very present type of presence. There, there are no smells, there is no touch. So I think it's quite a relevant question and I'd like to hear your thoughts on that, like Jose would. Thank you.
Um, yo diría que el tema de la digitalización. I would say that it is very interesting to to think about this digital world that would also bring some type of hierarchy for the community for the region we have to think about access to internet if that's democratic or, or not because that usually has a high cost at the communities where i work usually there is no internet or it is too expensive so it is very complicated in that regard but yes, it is very appropriate to think about that when it comes to urban areas like La Paz, for instance. And also, it brings the whole international concept, you know, thanks to internet. So we have to work in a very balanced way with what's digital and what's not digital for certain social classes and for certain regions where there is access versus the ones without access. We have to think that there are entire communities who are in remote places and even also urban areas that do not have that access to internet. So they should have access to internet, to information. They should be able to um, travel. We even created uh, traveling museum sort of that goes to different communities goes to different places to bring people closer to art to this information so we need a good balance between what's virtual and what's not what's digital and what's not we also have to think about that idea of touch screen for instance or tactile um, technology, we need to find a balance because for those who like screens, it is different. But I believe that education also has or also needs a reflection upon the feeling, you know, feeling with your fingers. It is different. You have a different experience in education when you do that. So all that brings us back to that idea of self-reflection about the fact that education cannot really depend on a screen. It cannot just depend on technology. You have to question that. Of course, you can work from home, you can work from anywhere, you can experiment, you can try different things. That's great. But there are some topics that we have to question because technology here as a, a thing that is consumed we have to think about who is benefiting from that. Usually people who use technology all the time, they, they don't really reflect upon the essence of what can be done with the real feelings, feeling something with your fingers, etc. We must find, again, a good balance. And as a museum, as professionals who work with this type of institutions, we are willing to work in that regard, to try and find a good balance for society. As Elvira says, we are thinking about access. What kind of access you have or you do not have to technology in the case of our museum, when we try to facilitate pedagogic experiences during the pandemic to be very specific to schools or neighborhoods that did not have access to technology. What we did here was to print folders with activities and we created, uh, we collected funds in order to take to schools that didn't have access to internet, these educational activities between art and education. And we also provided artistic material so that they could work. Of course, this has a limited reach because we would like all of the schools of the country to receive the, this material, but this was the beginning of a trajectory and this is what our team works when we think about social projects. On the other 
site for the Museum of Modern Art, we were forced to close our doors. So digita digitalization was an opportunity to update ourselves as, as an institution. We're an institution that is dedicated to artistic, social, and educational activities. And this didn't appear in our digital platform, so we updated them. And there is something also that happened that was touching for the entire team. This gave us, we became closer to all the different regions of the country and the different art, artistic scenes and the different pockets of the country. It was beautiful to be able to dialogue more with artists in different parts of Argentina, working with them closely so that they can produce their contents. And something that was very moving that in the past we worked with 7,000 faculty members a year from public and private schools from Buenos Aires and major uh, Buenos Aires in an in-person uh, modality. With this situation, our educational team had to, in a certain way, readapt it themselves. And we were able to work with teachers from the different pockets of Argentina and they used used the digital material that we were able to develop. And in reality, this was a highly revealing moment because this showed that there are positive aspects of this technology. When you have it, it's important to for it to be democratic, as Elvira says, and we have to see how this approach can be a bridge to propose and to materialize the ideas of artists throughout the country. And on the other side, it is cold, but it's necessary. And of course, when we see the financial side, I believe that we need funds to develop all of these projects. We are a public museum that depends from the ministry, depends on the Ministry of Culture of the city of Buenos Aires and technologies approached us to possible donors, not only from the country, but from the world. We had people, there were people that that have in their hearts a concern for Argentina, but they're in another part of the world. And they came to us to support the museum in the, diff in the different social and educational causes that we had. I believe there is a great path to pave and there are challenges, but there are certain tools that we can use and we just have to see how we can join all these different needs and possibilities so that we can come so that we can embrace the proposals of our artists and offer them to our society thank you very much victoria thank you elvira thank you for your words and thank you for sharing your experience with us thank you for for talking about your practice and for sharing your intellectual knowledge with us. We hereby conclude our event, but before that, I wanted to ask you if you have, if you want to give us your final remarks. Well, I would just like to thank you for this opportunity to dialogue with MASP with, uh, after all, we are a great admirer of MASP in Sao Paulo. We have lots of women here in the Museum of Modern Art. This is related to power situations that you mentioned. I don't know if we fulfilled all of our ideals. There are more women here and we have incorporated professionals from different parts of the country because we want to be more inclusive and federal 
and there is still a lot to do. So thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you and to Elvira. And uh, let's continue dreaming and let's be able to strengthen our institutions in our exchanges and everything that we can offer. Thank you very much. I would just like to thank all the organizers of mass for this program on decolonization. It's very interesting because this allows us to self-reflect and to see other points of view and also to I was able to share this moment with Victoria. She has given us her view. She has showed us what she does and we can understand through the dynamics, how we see these different positions and how to understand decolonization, because those actions will allow us to bear in mind the famous decolonization in broadened terms. So I would like to thank everybody that has followed us. I know that there is a very big team behind the stage, everybody that controls the screens, the audios, the people that create the platform. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Amanda, for guiding us with your questions and also because of the small self-reflections, because this also allows us to self-reflect. And a great hug to everyone. Thank, thank you. It was my pleasure. It was great to hear you both. As Elvira mentioned, this is a very large team. Many people worked in the organization of this event. We've got quite a few partnering institutions who have helped us put this together. So thank you. On March the 16th, we're going to have another debate on decolonizing gender with Ayurdex Spinoza and Daniela Brethley Chidley. We're also going to talk about decolonizing articles, universities, and art practices. So please make sure you stay tuned to our social media and websites. This text will be made available online and please keep on sharing your thoughts on such a relevant topic for all of us. Once again, thank you. Thank you, Elvira. Thank you, Victoria. And thank you to everyone who's watching us. We'll see you soon. See you next week. That's it. Bye-bye.